Psalm 100 Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Be still, the rest the soul of mine. Bow before the Prince of Peace. Let the noise and clamor cease. Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He is faithful. Consider all that he has done, stand in awe and be amazed, and know that he'll never change. Be still. Be still and know that he is God. your head upon his breast, listen to the rhythm of his unfailing heart of love, beating for his little ones, calling each of us to come. Be the 
about tomorrow it may bring me poverty but the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by my portion may be through the flame or flood but his presence goes before me and I'm covered by his blood many things about tomorrow to understand but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand but I know who holds tomorrow and I my hand Great is thy faithfulness Oh God
Father, we come before you and we ask, first of all, to forgive us of our sins and many of our wrongdoings in life. We know that when things are well, we tend to be thinking about our own selves, what we can do, what we should do, where we will go. When this problem comes to life, then do we remember to turn back to you. Lord, teach us not to forget you at all times. You are not just in our mind. May we also have you, not just in our heart, but to rule over us in every way. That whatever we think, whatever we do, for you will be the one to light guide us in what we have to decide on. Father, may your word also fill our hearts and minds at all times so that we will not be making decisions on our own, but rather to think how we can best honor you, how we can best love you, how we can best glorify you. Thank you once again for being very loving and comforting and also allowing us to reach up to you. May we always remember you're not just in our heart, you're not just in our mind, but you will also be in our life at all times to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 26. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 26. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when He had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up, and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as He went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, 
together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with eleven apostles. Good morning, church. It's an honor to open God's word with you today. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to do so. It's a pleasure to be with you even if online. So let's turn to God's word. May the spirit bless us with open ears and willing hearts that we may be hearers and doers of his word. This morning, we're beginning a new series on Acts where we'll see the spirit of God empowers the people of God equipped with the word of God to see it multiply all through Acts whenever the gospel moves from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, there's this phrase, and the word of God continue to spread and multiply. So in this series, we'll see how the word multiplies through the nations, and today we'll see that it it comes through spirit-empowered believers that God chooses to do his work. But what does it mean to be empowered? We live in a day and age where it's popular to talk about power. We read all the time and talk about politicians and evaluate them on how they are using their power. But this morning, I want to take the mirror of God's word For us to look at ourselves to see how have we been empowered and how are we using the power that God has given to us by his spirit. And in Acts 1, uh, the two main points this morning are that the spirit empowers us for witness of the word and the spirit empowers us with wisdom by the word. So let's look at those two points. The spirit empowers us for witness of the word and the spirit empowers us with wisdom by the word. So first, let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts 1 and see how this unfolds. In Acts 1, we see the very opening verses are, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So the first thing we need to note is that this is the second part. This is a sequel. Acts is a sequel to the first book, which is Luke. He wrote each of them to Theophilus. Um, And it's worth looking back for a moment just to see how that story ends. Of course, Luke begins with the the story of Jesus' birth and then tells of his life and ministry and teaching. It ends with his death. And the very last chapter, if we go back to Luke, um, the very last chapter looks at his resurrection, first of all. And then uh, he appears to disciples after the resurrection. The first disciples he appears to are the two disciples on the road to Emmaus who are discussing Jesus' death and his missing body. And Jesus comes alongside them and he keeps his identity secret until beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Um, The previous verse specifically mentions his death and resurrection. He then appears to the disciples gathered in Jerusalem, and after showing them his body and eating with them, he teaches them to interpret the gospel of his death and resurrection. And the text says, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, and he opened their mind to understand the scriptures that they would understand the necessity of his death and resurrection. 
So first we want to notice that one of the key things Jesus does after the resurrection is interpret the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection in terms of the scripture that people would understand the good news. But then it concludes, Luke concludes and says, he tells them to wait until they are empowered by the Spirit, that they would be a witness and proclaim that the repentance of the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So that's how Luke closes, that Jesus in his resurrection interprets the gospel in terms of the word of God and tells them to wait for the Spirit, that they would proclaim that gospel to the nations. Um, so the first thing we want to notice is the Spirit is empowering us to share a gospel that Jesus takes the time to teach, and it's rooted in the scriptures. So now let's turn back to Acts. And the opening verses of Acts summarize what happened at the end of Luke, that Jesus appeared after his resurrection, and again it records his command to wait to be empowered by the Spirit when Pentecost comes. So now let's look to verse 6 and look a little more carefully. Um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're, they're wondering whether Jesus, as a conquering Messiah, will use his power to conquer Rome and restore Israel. Notice is, uh, Jesus' response in verse 7. He said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So let's just pause right there and quickly say that often Jesus, when people ask about the end times, Jesus tells them not to worry about it, that the Father knows, not even Jesus knows. And um, I just want to say, I think that's true for us today as well. If we are interested to know what happens in the end, to know that Christ will come and conquer evil and restore all things, that's good. We are to live in hope. But if we are fascinated by trying to discern the dates and times specifically in which world leader we think will be the Antichrist and how close we are, I think our time, according to Jesus, is better spent following Jesus today and trusting him for tomorrow. There is a whole world of end times fascination that is less than edifying and sometimes can be distracting. So yes, to knowing our hope is sure and understanding how the story ends, but when trying to figure out the precise date, Jesus often tells us not to. But now I want to turn back and look at verse 8. Um, remember that in verse 6, they question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And in verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. So the power of God will not be exercised from above to conquer by force. Instead, the power of God will be exercised through the Holy Spirit in his people to bear witness. And bear witness to what? Well, the end of Luke told us. Jesus revealed from the scripture the good news of what his death and resurrection meant, and that through repentance and faith, forgiveness was available. So instead of conquering rebels, the Spirit would convict rebels and convert them into sons and daughters of the kingdom. In chapter 2, you'll see next week that Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father where he reigns, and he pours out his Spirit on the church, and it's through his Spirit that his kingdom is spreading in the church, and not, again, through force and crushing people, but in allowing them to repent and trust and be reconciled to the king. So to review... What is the purpose of the power God gives us by his spirit? It's to be witnesses. And what are we witnesses of? That Jesus died, rose again, and offers forgiveness to the nations. And what does this have to do with the kingdom? That Jesus reigns at the Father's right hand, and he is extending his rule by the Spirit's work to, in his people to proclaim the gospel to all nations, that rebels of the kingdom might be converted to being sons and daughters of the kingdom. So does this have anything to do with us? Yes, we live after Pentecost. The Spirit of God has come to us to convict us and enable us to repent and believe, and now dwells within us. We have the Spirit of God that those disciples were waiting for, and we have the same mission of God to be his witnesses. So that leads to the question, what does it mean to be empowered for witness? How does that work? And part of our answer can be by looking at the rest of the story in Acts, and also in looking at Paul's writings to know how does the Spirit of God work to empower us for witness. 
So the first thing I draw your attention to, to seeing how does the Spirit of God work, is the first thing I want to know, look at is how the Spirit of God works with the Word of God to allow us to see the Son of God. So the Spirit gives us power to know the power and love of God expressed to us in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, when Paul prays for the church, in Ephesians 1, 17 and following, he prays that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked us in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand in heavenly places. So one of the things the Spirit does and it gives us wisdom to be able to know that the hope we have and the power of God expressed towards us in raising him from the dead and raising us with him from the dead. Similarly, in Ephesians 3, Paul prays for the Spirit to give us the strength to know God's love. He prays in verse six, uh, Ephesians 3.16 that we would be strengthened with power through his Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Here again, we see the Spirit of God strengthening us that we could see the love of God expressed to us in Jesus, a love that's beyond comprehension. Remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Jesus enabled them to understand the gospel according to the scriptures, and their hearts burned within them. And Jesus said it was better for him to go away because he would then send a spirit, send a spirit to be within us. It is better to have the spirit inside us than to have Jesus walking alongside of us. So instead of Jesus walking beside us like he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we have the Spirit inside of us who strengthens us that through the Word of God, we can see the Son of God and see the, the love and power that has been expressed towards us. What does this have to do with being empowered for witness? Well, many times, as you know, when you go to share the gospel, we can be afraid and fear can dominate us. It is the love of God that casts out fear. And this is not just a matter of willpower, but of prayer and humility and receiving the work of the Spirit that we would know God's love for us in Jesus and be so enraptured in that love that it flows over and out and overcomes our fears to share the love of God expressed in Christ. That's good news. So the first thing I would suggest is we can be empowered as we pray for the Spirit to look at Christ and see him as beautiful and powerful, and how much love we have, how the Father has for us in Christ, all that we have will fill our hearts and cast out fear and give us power to speak. But the second thing I want to say is that the Spirit empowers our witness through the actual speaking and proclamation of the gospel. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 has an extended sermonette on how he did not come with wise and clever preaching, but it was the Spirit of God using the foolishness of preaching to powerfully save the listeners. Brothers and sisters, we do need to know the gospel and we need to grow in sharing the gospel. But we always have to remember that it's not with our clever words that people come to faith. We don't have to win them in our own strength. We share and allow the Spirit to work. In fact, many of you have probably had the experience of sharing the gospel and sensing that God was already at work in the lives of those you shared with, and they were hungry to know. And you realize this was more, it wasn't just me or my clever words. I just shared the good news and God was already at work. Sometimes you also have the experience where we, we speak the gospel and it comes out so clear and so smooth. We think that is, that was more than just me and my mind and my intellect. God was, God was shaping the words I use, and they were timely. And sometimes you don't feel anything at all. You share and you wonder if anything happened, but we're faithful. And sometimes we pray for years for friends and family members to come to faith. And then mysteriously, one day they're ready and the Spirit of God works. The point is the Spirit empowers our witness. We are not alone 
It is not up to our power or our cleverness. The Spirit of God can strengthen us to be full of the love of God and to know the hope of God and the power of God to make us bold. And the Spirit of God is also at work as we preach and share the gospel. And when I say preach, I just, I just mean to, to proclaim. As we share the gospel, whether it's just with a friend or with a group or whatever setting it is, we share and the Spirit uses that to bring people to Him. And God is at work. He empowers us as His witness, as His witnesses. So the first half of Acts, I want to suggest to you, the Spirit empowers us for witness of the Word. The Spirit, first of all, is rooted in the Word, where the Spirit helps us root into the Word and understand the Gospel. And as we take those words, the Spirit empowers our speech. But the second half of the chapter also gives us another insight, that the Spirit empowers us with wisdom by the Word. So the second half of the chapter is a story while they are waiting. So starting in verse 12, um, they, the disciples, return to Jerusalem. And notice in verse 12 and 13, it shows them obediently waiting as Jesus commanded them. And also notice in verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So in the context of obedience, in the context of prayer, Peter stands up and leads the, leads the group by interpreting Jesus' death, or Judas' death, sorry, and the need to find another apostle in terms of what Scripture says. Notice verse 16. Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And so he interprets the experiences they're having in terms of the Word of God and leads them to select a new apostle. One of the things that we'll see throughout the story of Acts is as the gospel spreads, there are always new challenges and new unknowns. How is the church going to take care of orphans and the widows? Or in Acts 15, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Do they have to keep the law? And one of the things that happens over and over in Acts is that the church, empowered by the Spirit of God, looked to the Word of God and God gave them wisdom. None of the situations is exactly the same. Each narrative emphasizes different things, but we can note the following. That God gives them understanding of their times and situation in alignment with Scripture in order to continue his mission. And in Acts, it says the Holy Spirit, Acts 15 in particular, was involved in their discussions. It seemed good to them and the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.17 also tells us what many other scriptures affirm, that the Spirit is the source of wisdom for his people. So we're not only empowered for witness of the word, but we're empowered for wisdom by the word. Again, a common question is, how does God do that? Jesus said when he was still here on earth that the Spirit would guide us into all truth, but he didn't say how he would do this. There is no formula. And today I just want to talk briefly um, because you'll hear many answers about how to hear the wisdom that comes from the Spirit. Some will say, just wait until you have a feeling of peace. And when the feeling of peace comes, you know. Others will say, empty your mind and pray and ask the Spirit. And the first thing that comes into your mind, that's from God. Or others will say, list all the verses about it and just think about how it all relates and it will come to you. And what I would suggest to you is that those all reduce um, the work of God down to one aspect of our lives, either our feelings or our thoughts. Um, God doesn't tell us how the Spirit will guide us in the truth, but he does tell us many things. Uh, first of all, we can see from this example that we must root ourselves in the Scripture to know God's character and God's mission. Peter is interpreting his experience in terms of what God has said, just as Jesus interpreted his death and resurrection in terms of what God had said. We also know that the Spirit is ultimately forming us to be like Christ in submitting to God, loving him, and loving others. And I would suggest that we should expect that the Spirit will engage both our minds and our emotions, that it will align with what we understand of the Word of God, and we will have an emotional response as well, maybe or maybe not, um, related to the submitting and understanding that, yes, I'm going to follow God no matter what. As you notice that they're gathered in prayer, seeking to know God and his mission, 
submitting their ways before him. And when we do that, we let go of fear and self-justification and putting to death our own pursuit of glory. Instead, God's wisdom from above, James says, is peaceable. And he gives it to those who ask generously. How that happens, I'm not saying there's any one formula or any one way, but I would suggest if it has the hallmark of being rooted in um, our attempts to understand Scripture, grounded in prayer and humility and asking God for wisdom, and it leads towards us being more like Christ in laying down our lives and living for his glory, the Spirit will lead and guide us. We are not alone. We are not left to our own resources. The Spirit is with the church, and as we seek to follow him, he will guide us. The Spirit empowers us for witness of the word, and the Spirit empowers us with wisdom by his word. So I want to challenge you today with these three things. First of all, I want to challenge you to pray. Go to those prayers that Paul has for his church in Ephesians 1, at the end of Ephesians 1 and, and Ephesians 3, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you and help, help all of us to know God's love and his power that we would be full of the love of God in our lives and be sure and that love would cast out fear, that we would be ready to share. And then I'd ask you to pray, who can you share the gospel with this week? And if you're unsure how to share the gospel, who can I ask for help this week to know the gospel story better that I could share it? So ask God one of two things. Who should I share the gospel with this week? Or if you don't feel like you're ready, who in the church can help me better be equipped to share the gospel this week? And finally, I would ask you to think, how can I trust God to give me wisdom this week? Um, to be received in alignment with scripture, knowing God's character and mission, to be received in the humility of prayer, and aimed at a life of love for God and love for others, imitating Christ. Brothers and sisters, God has given us his Holy Spirit. His Spirit can give us power, not the power of the world that shows off in fireworks, but the power that shapes us to be like Christ, to be bold, to trust, to preach the gospel, and to watch what he does as the word of God spreads. And as we do, we will enter many unknown situations, and we can trust that we are not alone. We are not left to our own resources, but God will be with us, and he will give us the wisdom we need if we ask for it. And to receive with prayer, to receive in alignment with his character and his mission, what he wants us to do in each and every situation. So with that in mind, let's pray and ask God to bless us with his power and with his wisdom this week as we go forth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, giving us your Holy Spirit. Even better than Jesus walking next to us is the Holy Spirit within us. And we ask that your spirit would strengthen our inner man, that we would be able to know the love of God through Christ in our lives, that we would know the fullness of your love, that we would know the power you've expressed in bringing us from death to life, and to know that we are with you and you are with us. Would you give us then boldness, being rooted in your love? Would you cast out fear? Would you give us power to boldly share our faith this week? And I pray that as we do, we will not trust in our own cleverness, but will simply by faith in the foolishness of preaching, just share what we know of you and your gospel, and that we would watch and see you work and give you glory. God, we also know that we have many situations um, and need much wisdom from you. Would you give us your spirit to lead us into humility and in asking you for wisdom, to relying on you, to seeking your will in all circumstances. Would you help us to trust that we're not alone and left up to our own resources? Would you lead and guide us in all ways? Would you help us to hear the voice of you, our good shepherd, and follow you obediently, giving us wisdom um, step by step? Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it's spreading throughout the world. Would you help us wherever you've placed us to bear witness with your power and to live winsomely with your wisdom? In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello everyone, good morning. Ati Pilar po ito and uh, asal ko ay nandito pa ako sa Teres Arizal. At inaabot po namin ang uh, dalawang barangay po dito sa Teres Arizal. Yung mga aduluduluhan po and uh, meron din po kami doon sa Samorong. Mga lugar na liblib at mga mahihirap po na mga nakatira doon. And uh, nag-start po kami doon ng feeding sa mga bata. At uh, sa lukuyan po ay may mga... Uh, regular Bible studies na po kami, cell group among youth and uh, sa mga magulang. And uh, doon po sa Morong ay uh, we have now also every Saturday regular Bible study na kung saan po ay uh, pareho pong uh, doon kami sa malit na kubo and uh, sa ilalim po ng punong mangga. Okay, at pag umuulan at nagtak- nagtatakbuhan. Okay, and uh, yun po ang ano namin doon na uh, prayer po namin ay uh, of course po mga Uh, Bibles and school materials or uh, teaching materials for the kids and uh, yung feeding uh, program po namin doon. So every time, every Saturday or Saturday sa Morong ang feeding uh, program namin doon at the same time Bible study and uh, sa Sunday naman po sa tatlong sitio po yun okay, sa, dito sa Teresa and uh, very challenging nga po dahil nga kami po isa puno-puno lamang kayo ng mga mangga at sa mga kapitbahay. Okay. So, uh, nung last April po ay uh, galing ako doon sa, nagpunta ako sa Mindoro. Almost two months po ako doon. And, uh, nireach out po namin ang tatlong barangay. Po, isa sa Mamburaw at dalawa doon po sa sa Abra de Ilog. At mga liblib din po na lugar. And thank God na lalo pong uh, lumalago yung gawain doon. Okay. Ginamit din ng Diyos ang pagkamatay ni Pastor Val na laging, uh, ano, mas naging aktibo yung kabataan. And uh, maawot na sila ngayon sa mga kabataan lang ay mga 50 plus na. And of course, meron din kids, meron din magulang. And uh, makikita mo din yung aggressiveness nila or yung willingness and the fire okay, na para po uh, talaga sa Panginoon. Uh, isang uh, ano po yan ng COVID-19. And uh, please pray for their... Uh, Uh, health also kasi po meron pong uh, sad to say po ay uh, may namatay po doon isang kapatiran na na, na COVID po siya okay. and uh, lately po ng isang linggo lang po and uh, ang aming prayer request po doon ay yung uh, Bibles din po and uh, support for the feeding uh, uh, program and uh, yung water system namin <laughs> napakahira po doon ng tubig yung lahil ang inihigiban at yung ginagamit namin yung tricycle ay karag-karag na. <laughs> Halos maghiwalay na. Pero, thank God for that. At meron pa rin. So, we're praying for uh, transportation po doon dahil napakalayo po ng mga pinupuntahan namin doon. And, uh, salamat po sa Panginoon na andyan po kayo. Okay? Giving us your support, your encouragement, your prayers, and uh, uh, nalalapit na talaga ang pagdating ng Panginoon. At, kailangan nating abutin ang pinakasulok-sulokan. And as sure as there is a uh, God is with us. And uh, thank you so much po sa, pa, sa prayer request ko dito para sa sarili ko ay uh, matunaw na po yung mga bato sa aking gallbladder at saka sa kidney. Okay? And uh, thank you so much dahil yung protection ng Panginoon, despite na tayo ay uh, hindi na bumabata, tumatanda na. Okay? Senior na po, 64 years old and uh, still the strength God na binibigay niya sa akin okay? and the passion to do the mission work okay? so, thank God and uh, uh, salamat po na uh, I'm doing right now yung uh, uh, sabi, operahan ako sa aking kidney stone ay sa aking gallbladder stone delikado daw po yun pero I'm doing now the natural remedy and thank God of course ang God ang maghihil sa akin okay, maraming maraming salamat po and uh, just uh Uh, continue to pray for us when we're praying for you too and uh, sa panguna po ni Pastor Mike sa mission team and uh, sa lahat po ng mga uh, brothers and sisters po sa USA. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Today's crisis is giving every family a unique opportunity to unfold and live out God's plan. 
What plans will you make to build a strong generation of disciples for Christ in your family? Family discipleship. It's about loving your family enough and caring enough to want to bring them closer to God. It's about using your family time to intentionally think about, talk about, and practice the gospel. Reading the Bible together, praying together, doing it intentionally and consistently. Hello to our UECG family. This is from your friendly neighborhood pastor, also from San Juan. Guys, we would like to invite you as Tammy and I would be sharing to you in a seminar called Family Discipleship on how we can start having that discipleship culture within our own homes. Did you know that the best place to start discipleship is right at the very place where you live? Among your kids, among spouses, because family, as what my teacher said before, is the basic unit of society. And if the family is healthy, there would be a higher probability that the church would also be healthy. So we are excited, Tammy and I are excited to share to you our journey, the mistakes we've made, the best practices that we have, and the learnings we had along the way. So see you this month for our family discipleship. And uh, God bless you guys.